So I'm going to present on a topic here. Uh, it's a very high level uh, coverage of a topic which I think is going to become more emerging in our space, and that is the concept of integrating OT security functions into a security operations center. Before we do that, I'm going to start with a little commercial on Dragos. So for those of you who don't know who Dragos is or what we do, um, we focus on industrial cybersecurity. And we really have three core tenants to what we do. Um, the first and foremost is we are a technology company. So we have the Dragos platform. It is a passive monitoring tool designed for OT environments that is going to enable you to have asset discovery, threat detection, and incident response capabilities in one platform. Now, the other two components that Dragos offers really uh, accentuate the platform. And we have a services team. The professional services team are able to augment and, and assist our clients with any proactive, reactive type engagements, whether that's a threat hunt or incident response on a retainer. And then we also have a threat intelligence team. And this is key to uh, the Dragos platform because the essence of what we do to detect threats comes directly from threat intelligence. So we have analysts that research, understand what threats exist in the wild, and we aggregate that and make that available through our Worldview portal. Um, so both of those, are all, all three are product streams available from Dragos. But the services team and the Worldview team um, also facilitate the platform by enabling better content. So our threat detections, which are based upon behavior analytics, come from our threat intelligence team. And we also have playbooks to try to guide you through that response. That comes from our services team. So you get a lot of that Dragos expertise funneled through the Dragos platform. So now let's talk about the good stuff. So we're going to talk about an OT SOC, so Operations Technology Security Operations Center. And we're going to talk about a few different approaches you can have for that. I want to leave you with some considerations, just some things to think about when you're exercising the possibility of an OT SOC. We'll go through an example of how that would impl be implemented in, in, uh, in the real world. And then we'll talk a little bit about what, what's next. If you are looking to explore into uh, expanding uh, security operations for your OT network, what would you do next? So I'm going to first start off with defining what a SOC is. And if you're like me, when you think of a SOC, this is what you think of. I would challenge that this is not actually appropriate. This is a little bit of a, a misnomer. There's a lot more to it than just monitors and technology in a dark room with lots of analysts looking down, head down on keyboard. So let's define what we mean by a security operations center, first of all, so we have a level playing field. I've defined it as this, and I'm not going to read through this, these two, uh, two sections or these two sentences, but I do want to highlight a couple things here. There is a core component of people. There are individuals that are running the operations center. They are driven by a mission to improve security operations for that company. They're using a combination of technology, intelligence, and data to help them accomplish that task. So this is the, the kind of foundation of what we're working on and what a regular enterprise security operations center may look like. So breaking that down, the, th the three core components to a security operations center are going to be your people, the technology, and the process. So first and foremost, you have to have people. This is a human-driven exercise. We'd love to have AI and machine learning run this for us. The reality is you need personnel to run this. Those personnel are going to have a combination of different skills. There's going to be a lot of domain expertise. You're going to get in some really intricate things through that security operations process. You're going to have to have multi-skill teams. So you're going to have to have very domain experts in one realm, maybe in threat intelligence, and then perhaps somebody else is going to help you with your OT component, somebody who's going to help you uh, deploy your firewall configurations, and so on. There's a lot of different skills, and those are going to go uh, with varying degrees of domain expertise. And that brings us to our tiered support. When you have a security operations center, you're not going to have one person that's going to man this. You may, and you may grow, but you're typically going to have a tiered approach to that. The technology is what's going to enable the people to be effective at what they're doing. So the first and foremost, you have to define your technology based upon the collection that's available to you. So by collection, I mean the ability to consume enough data for you to understand what your environment looks like and then process and interpret that. That's going to enable visibility. Visibility of your assets, what you have, what they do, how they talk to one another. Visibility into detection. How am I going to detect and automate some of that threat detection? You can't expect one person or a team of people to be able to do this. So there's efficiencies that come from deploying technology. And then there's going to be workflows to, that are defined to that. And that ties back in then to process. So with any organization, if you don't have process, you have chaos. So especially when you have multiple teams with various different um, uh, direction. And so having consensus-based process, something that everyone has agreed upon, um, that's adaptable with clearly defined swim lanes. The other thing I want to really point out here about process is it has to be tested. 
because you don't want to be in a situation where your security operations center is being required to do some sort of incident response, and you're only then just working out, ah, that process workflow is kind of broken. We should have probably done that. So testing is essential to having success uh, with all of this uh, deployment. So taking that a step further, what are the primary functions of a SOC? First and foremost, you've got preparedness. Are we prepared to have the appropriate collection and visibility of our environment to enable us to be successful? Have we incorporated threat intelligence, a greater awareness of what exists in the world, which are lessons learned perhaps from other utilities or other customers that we can share and then improve our defenses around that? And then are we appropriately, uh, as, is our network appropriately configured for this? Do we have the appropriate firewall hardening in, in place? Now, this is obviously not an exhaustive list. This is just some suggestions to help guide you on the road of preparedness. So now let's move to proactive. So the primary security function is typically, for a SOC, is typically referred to as like a reactive incident response. But I would argue there's a lot of value in doing proactive scheduled assessments. So one example of that could be threat hunting. You have your team of incident responders. Why wait for an incident to test them and, and, and go through that process? Why not come up with some hypothesis based upon threat intelligence or other things that have occurred to drive that investigation? And then you can start to work out where, where you're strong, where you have gaps, uh, and adapt that ready for an incident. The second thing could be vulnerability assessments and then tabletop exercises. Tabletop exercises are becoming more and more commonplace, and this is a, a great step in the right direction. Tabletop is where you would consider the idea of let's go through and test and validate these processes with a team, with various stakeholders, perhaps using outsourced guidance on that. This is something that Dragos has facilitated in a number of uh, client engagements, but it helps us be prepared for ultimately the reactive state. And the reactive function is where you're now responding to something that technology has detected, and now you're leveraging your team and your technology and your process to exercise and look into that. So investigating an alert, we do know that alert fatigue is a real thing, so being able to ascertain is the alert legitimate right from the get-go. Um, gathering the appropriate forensics, and more importantly, getting to root cause analysis. As a controls engineer, I've uh, often been in the case where um, something happened. The machine is not working right. The system isn't quite right. But recovery and remediation is, is essential. Business operations requires that. So you focus more on that and less on root cause analysis. And it could be a, a, a rabbit hole. You could go completely down root cause analysis to something that wastes a lot of time and resources. So performing the appropriate amount of root cause analysis is, a, is an essential part of the uh, final step of the re, uh, reactive side of things. So, Let's take that concept of a SOC, and now let's define that more into the concept of an OT SOC. So we've got the same language here for the most part, and I've highlighted the things in green, to really focus on the mission impact to OT systems. That's what we're defining here. An enterprise SOC has an agenda, has direction, and has focus, but OT systems we know are very different. We'll talk a little bit about that. So it's optimizing the capabilities of that team, perhaps using the same technology, perhaps using others, perhaps using the same data sets, perhaps using others, and so on. So quick question, what might some of those differences be between an IT SOC and an OT SOC? Starting to get a little bit more specific. Does anyone have any uh, protocols, industrial protocols? And for that, sir, you can get a Drago SOC or SOCs at the end, so come by me. Uh, any, any other uh, questions or any, sorry, any other uh, insight on what might be the differences? The people, so the skills and the, and the awareness, absolutely. Process. <laughs> All right, I might, I might give you some stuff. So come, come at me at the end, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you some talks for that. But let's, let's kind of break that down. And again, not an exhaustive list, but very high level. We talked about the protocols. Uh, so the industrial protocols and the interpretation of what those industrial protocols, very different from the enterprise side. A lot of proprietary protocols, so being able to dissect that and understand what that means is essential. I'm going to come back up to point one because that wasn't mentioned, but you have very diverse endpoints in your OT environment. You have embedded controllers, you have Windows-based things, you have a lot of legacy operating systems. There's a number of different types of endpoints, so your coverage and your collection has to be adaptable to all of those endpoints. You also have to have the ability to understand the OT environment from an asset perspective. So industrial controllers, DCS systems, HMIs, all very different from enterprise systems. They may use IT technology. Your engineering workstation is probably using the same corporate-issued PC that enterprise uh, has uh, given you. Um, but understanding that mission and the impact of what that uh, function is is essential. 
The other thing that's important about both the technology and skill side of the SOC is understanding the language and the acronyms. And it's okay, some people are going to get them wrong, especially if they're new to OT. Sometimes you'll hear SCADA, ICS, and OT sort of interchangeably used. Um, but understanding what the asset is and essentially the prioritization of the asset is important, not just for visibility and collection, but also communication. Make sure you're having the right conversations with your controls engineers, and then you're building credibility. Um, consequence awareness is probably one of the most prevalent things here. Running Nessus or an Nmap scan we know can have consequences. But if you're, most of us do here, I think. But there is some you know, misconceptions, perhaps an IT security guy might be like, sure, I'm going to run the same tool I run in my enterprise network, and there is a ripple effect that's going to impact your process. So having awareness of that consequence is, uh, is, is paramount. Also understanding the environment. Not just talking about the environments, uh, the, the types of environments where you're going to deploy this technology, but just PPE. If I'm going to go out and check an asset and I have to put my hard hat, respirator, and things like that, having awareness of that, that's essential OT uh, knowledge. And then also having an understanding of the threat landscape. It's, you can control your own domain and you can see the threats that are relevant to you, but if you broaden that to, to incorporate threat intelligence sources and learning from the events, the Triton Trisys malware, or learning from Crash Override and Destroyer, those things can really help prepare you, even though you wouldn't have normally seen that in the scope of the data that you would normally look at in your environment. All right, so key here, optimization for an OT environment. So um, for those of you that recall, back in 2018, uh, two master debaters were going at it, uh, two, two close colleagues of mine, Dan Scali and Rob Lee, and they were debating the concept of an enterprise SOC incorporating OT security functions or an OT dedicated SOC. And I actually rewatched it again just in preparation for this presentation. I really enjoyed it again the second time around, so I encourage you, if you haven't seen it, to check that out. Um, it was a very balanced uh, uh, discussion. But I think the key thing that I took from that is that both were advocating that the awareness needs to be around the OT mission. Whether you have your own SOC whether you, for OT functions, whether you enroll that into your enterprise SOC, there is no right or wrong way. It has to apply to your environment and the team you have. Um, but I would say the key there that both, both um, debaters were advocating for was OT mission focus. So here are some different approaches. So I'm going to kind of broaden the, the net. So Dan and Rob are both are advocating for building OT functions into an IT SOC or having a dedicated OT SOC. So if you have an IT SOC already, it makes sense. You already have made an investment in the type of technology, the personnel to do that. So expanding their breadth into the OT SOC absolutely might make sense for you. Conversely, you may have multiple IT SOCs already. You may have other security centers for physical awareness. So having a dedicated OT SOC might fit your model. I would also suggest that there are some other uh, uh, possibilities. The third one here, you probably already have, if you're depending on the type of environment you have, you may have a control system operation center where folks are looking at process variables, looking at um, set points, recipes, batch control, things like that. You may want to consider rolling security functions into that. Ha we haven't seen that a whole lot, but that is a, that is a possibility. The fourth option here is that you may just want to outsource that. And there are a lot of MSSPs that now are emerging in that space where they can provide those security functions to possibly augment or grow or build or just fill gaps that you may have at that time. And then obviously, you can mix and match any of these. So they've kind of got the fifth category here being the hybrid approach. Now, quick commercial here. Dragos will be in March releasing what we call a managed threat hunting service. The threat hunting service is going to take the Dragos expertise to use the Dragos platform and help you with some of your security functions that you may not already have in-house. Um, more on that will be re released in March. And just to follow up on this, this is the two uh, the individuals, Dan and Rob, that we're advocating and where they tie in and the common place here. Okay. So, OT takes a village. Right? There's a lot of different stakeholders. We've got the security enterprise functions. We've got process engineers. We've got a number of different stakeholders. And it's important to be aware of everyone that you have in that environment that, so that they're involved early in the discussion. Um, no one feels left out. And it's also important to understand that a lot of these different teams may have different leadership. They may have different core responsibilities. And they may sometimes be in conflict. So involving all stakeholders early is pretty, pretty important. So just to kind of call out some, we've got IT security. Uh, we've obviously got OT security. Going to go with the cowboy every time on that one. I'm sorry. Um, but then we've also got our process and controls engineers. It's really important for them to convey their concerns, the impact analysis that any of your operations are going to have You've also got your leadership. 
leadership teams need to be involved because not only are they ultimately responsible for risk, but they're also going to be responsible for any communications and so on. So I've also got PR and communications in here. Depending on your size, your organization, that might be more significant than others. And then finally, the vendors. The vendor relationship that a lot of our customers have is pretty key and essential to their operation. So coming back, if you're going to evaluate what skills and capabilities you have in-house, you want to offset that against the three pillars we had before, preparedness, proactive, and reactive. Do my existing skills and capabilities allow me to cover that today? Where do I want to be tomorrow? And do I need to fill those gaps temporarily, perhaps with some sort of contractor, third-party resource, or, or so on? But I would focus on these three domains. So tiering, it's often heard in SOC environments that you've got tier one, tier two, and tier three analysts. So just a quick kind of awareness on that. Your tier one an analyst is typically the individual that's going to take that inbound alert, do a little bit of validation and verification, and then if there is something there that needs to be escalated, then it would be escalated up to tier two. So your tier one is going to be typically your initial response and triage. Tier two is where you start to develop more skills, more capabilities. This team is going to be um, basically called in when tier one feels it's necessary. They're going to conduct the primary investigation. They're going to have the skills, the resources to be able to go in and do that, aware of the consequences of doing so, and then if necessary, gathering the necessary forensics. And then finally, you've got your tier three. This is the, the, the subject matter expertise or the domain expertise that you may have. Um, to rely upon if you need it. An example of that could be malware reverse engineering. That's a very specific skill. It's not going to be exercised down here very often, but up at tier three, that's something you want to have on hand. Now, it's important to note that you probably may not have to have all three tiers in-house if you are looking to develop your OTSOC in-house. These are things that you could perhaps have some of it in-house, some of it even uh, as a part of your enterprise security team, and then other areas where you use an, out an outsource party to help you fulfill that function. At Dragos, we do have malware reverse engineers, and I know that that's a very specific skill. Every time I talk to them, it blows my mind because they are really that smart. Um, but it's not something you would, you, know, you would task with some of this more trivial tier one or tier two type activity. And I would argue that the depth of OT experience as you move up through this tiered pyramid um, definitely increases, especially uh, once you get near the tier three. So another important component for your OT SOC is collection. What are the data sources available for you to analyze to help you complete that mission? So we're going to start with uh, network-based. NetFlow. NetFlow, if you have the infrastructure available to you, will give you good connection logs, and you have a very high-level understanding of who's talking to who, um, but very minimal payload information. So it's, it, it has minimal value, but it might be something that's easily attainable. Um, offline PCAPs. You may have an environment that is so segmented that you can't get access into your SOC. So having to bring an, a PCAP offline, kind of sneak a net that in, might be something available to you. And then if you do have that persistent network monitoring, span and, and tap. And in my experience, working in control environments down at lower levels, just having a managed switch was not always a commonplace. So the ability to be able to pull that span and tap could limit your, your visibility and your collection. Now moving into endpoint, and I don't want to go through all of these in too much detail, but syslog, for example, a fantastic source of endpoint logging information when an event occurs, it's pushed in, and you can analyze that. And then once we move up the tier, we get to like historian events or APIs or specialty logs. That's where you really have to have a significant amount of expertise, perhaps some reverse engineering, perhaps some collaborative partnerships that allow you to get access to that data. Very rich data, but the complexity to pull that out and implement that definitely goes up. So you've got to look at what's available to you. And in a very diverse OT environment, uh, that's, this is essential to do that a collection management framework analysis. Um, and that will help set you for success, at least knowing what you've got available today and where you want to grow and build upon. So the chances are, if you're looking at deploying an OT SOC, you've probably got a number of different plants. You've probably got an expansive area that you're covering. So the first thing is you need to identify what is within scope of this SOC. What plants, where are they physically located? What countries do we have cultural teams and barriers that we need to take care of? That's going to be step one. Step two is, of those plants, what are the crown jewels? What are the enclaves or the areas uh, of that environment that are specific that we want to focus our energy and our efforts on from an OT SOC perspective? And then finally, it's the network architecture. Now, this is where things really will define your success, because these lower levels are going to uh, define what collection is available to you. 
Um, you're going to work very closely with your vendors at that point. Maybe they do support syslog already. Maybe they don't. Maybe they support Windows event logs already. So there's going to be this uh, collection management framework exercise that occurs down here, because this is the crown jewels. These are the things that you want to analyze, because it's ultimately going to risk production and risk your operations. So having awareness of what switches are available, are they managed? Can we pull enough collection from that? What visibility does that allow us to see? But ultimately, what are the endpoints? What are the endpoints of most concern? And you would probably perform some sort of um, threat model to determine what that might be. And that will help define where you need to improve your architecture and ultimately pull in that data to your SOC. OK. Now, when I think of OT SOC technology, I think of dashboards and pew-pew maps. Everyone loves a pew-pew map, right? You go into a SOC, and you're going to see stuff. Very little value. So I would argue that OT SOC technology is definitely a lot more expansive than this. So quick audience participation. What would be one of the key things you would expect to see in your OT SOC from a, from a technology standpoint? Uptime status. Uptime status? Asset management. Asset management. One more. Anyone else? Network architecture. So yeah, so the tools that are going to enable uh, that, are, I'm going to define a number of different technologies here. So the first one is the SIM. Your typical SOC is going to have a SIM. Let's embrace that. You've already got that log collection, the ability to take that security information, event management, consume those logs, and do something with that. Um, so some, some, like for example, Dragos has a relationship with Splunk. Splunk is heavily used in security operations. So why not already use that tool that's collecting those logs? You're going to have some sort of ticketing function, the ability to create a ticket to perform an investigation uh, when something occurs. You're going to have your endpoint detection and response information. So what asset discovery, or sorry, not asset discovery, what AV or what endpoint agents you might be running are also another point of collection that needs to be managed from within that SOC. You're also going to have your threat intelligence platform, that gathering of information in one centralized dashboard. Then you've got your firewall management. That's another component. You've got CMDB, so someone mentioned asset discovery, so your um, configuration management database. You're probably going to have vulnerability management also in scope of that. And then finally, you've got your OT monitoring tool. So there's a lot of different technologies that you may want to look at that may be a part of this. The, th the key thing I want to leave with you here is that that's a lot of management, a lot of overhead. So if we had the Drago's platform in here as your OT monitoring tool, the key part is integrations. Integrations to your business means efficiencies. The more those tools work together, that we can minimize the workflows, we can have centralized dashboards and screens, and this is ultimately what we're getting to, and then we can drive those pew pew maps with actual, actual accurate data. Um, but there are a number of different technologies you probably want to want to consider. So let's go through a, a SOC example response process. So in this case, the Drago's platform detected an incident. There was some sort of a threat behavior that we detected that we um, so the, the first step of that is, let's get that into the SIM. That's where that tier one analyst is mostly looking at that, that central dashboard. So through integration, Drago's platform puts that into the SIM. They can then go through the verification process. After that, if they verify that there is an incident that's worth investigating, they're going to create a case. So they're going to go to their ticketing console, create a case. Now again, with the Drago's platform, it's possible to have an integration to that. So you can now drive that ticket into your Drago's platform to perform the incident response. We have full case management functions, but at the end of the day, you're going to have a centralized ticketing platform. So integration is pretty key. And then from there, you're going to guide, you're going to investigate driven by guidance from a playbook. So this is a really um, a distinguished feature of the Drago's platform is taking that services team experience to give you, like, these are the, the human readable steps on what you need to perform. And we can even incorporate integrations to that. So let's say taking action was to quarantine an asset. You maybe had ransomware, you want to quarantine that asset. You can take that action through integration from with, with, uh, within the Drago's platform as part of your response. Then you're going to also feed that integration back into your original ticketing system so that you can update the case. And then moving forward, you're going to start getting into the recovery phase. Now, in this example, I've used backups as an example because you may have to just rewipe the system and start from scratch. But there are a number of different elements to the recovery process. And then you start to review and adjust. And this is an important part. Having, this is an iterative process. You're not going to get it right the first time. And you need to be able to review and adapt as you improve. So, an OT SOC isn't right for everyone. So the first thing is you need to evaluate your readiness to be able to do that. First of all, does the risk to your business and the interruption to OT systems justify the investment in the first place? We've already talked about the three pillars. You've got technology, you've got people, and you've got process to invest in. That's a significant investment. 
Secondly, does your current infrastructure allow you to do that? Do you have managed switches? Do you have log collection? Do you have the data available to help you do that? If not, you can work out that roadmap to doing so. Do you already have budget? Do you have to work with the leadership team to convince them? If so, what are some of the pain points? How can you emphasize that to help you uh, develop that budget? Fourth, do you have the resources? We could be in-house, could be looking at vendors, could be some sort of third-party resource. Where do you need to fulfill some of the gaps that you have? And then we talk, I talked about this in my sponsor stage session last year about maturity models. There are a couple of maturity models uh, that I reference, sand sliding scale of maturity and the arc maturity model. They help you kind of assess where you're at and uh, uh, essentially your readiness for uh, investing in a SOC. And then ultimately, what are your objectives? Is the SOC going to allow you to meet those objectives? Some other considerations you might want to think about is scale. Once I deploy this, I'm not going to get it right first time. I'm going to need to grow. So do I have the resources to help me today? Does the technology allow me to do that? What are the limitations of that technology? Um, and more importantly, am I aware of the licensing? If I deploy a licensing model that is on asset count, and I've only worked on one plant, and I'm going to expand it to 50 other plants, that licensing model is going to grow with that. So you need to consider that as part of your scale and your expansion. The second thing, integrations. As part of your validation process, make sure you're fully aware of the integrations and how they can tie together. If you've already invested in a technology and you've already got teams trained and you've already got that line of support established, use it if it makes sense to do so. So that's an important component. And then if this OT SOC is being driven out of need in the first place, you may argue that there's a need for an element of redundancy. Do I need two SOCs? And if so, how do I break them up into primary and secondary functions? And then finally, how are you going to measure the success of that? I'm not going to give you KPIs because you're ultimately going to need to define those yourselves, but some common ones when you're first building a SOC is coverage. What is my percentage coverage of my number of assets? Then once I've got the SOC established, is how effective is it at catching stuff? Mean time to discovery and mean time to recovery might be a useful KPI for you to look at. How long does it take for our analysts to detect using the technologies and processes they have today? So if you're looking to go down this road, where should you begin? Don't try to boil the ocean. First, define your goals. What are your gaps? What is it you're trying to accomplish? And break that down into your coverage goals, reactive ability, and your proactive ability. Once you have that definition, now you can evaluate those capabilities, what gaps you have, where do you need to expand collection, investment in technology, skills development, and then break it up over multiple years. Like I said, don't try to, to build a SOC right from the get-go that does everything. M take it in phases. It may well be that you already have the basis for a SOC in your team. You're just not calling it that today. And then more importantly, it's an iterative process. You're going to grow, you're going to adapt, you're going to grow, you're going to adapt. It's not going to be an investment. You check it off and you're done, like with most security functions. You need to be aware of how are we going to grow and develop the program? Are we going to increase our coverage? How are we going to optimize our processes? And how can we get deeper visibility into the networks that count? If you are interested in following up on this, there are some resources I would recommend that are both on the Dragos website. One is about building that collection management framework, which is an essential step in that path. And secondly, um, a, pipe, uh, a paper on to uh, uh, insight into ICS SOCs. So to close out, there is no one-size approach to this. You are going to do what's right for you. There are just things that you might want to follow and be, and, and be driven towards. Um, but don't assume that just because company A is doing it this way, that's the way you should be doing it. Evaluate what is right for your business, your needs, your risk, your exposure. Focus on the mission. Thirdly, just be aware that when you are making this investment, you're investing in people, technology, and process. Those are the three core tenets that you're going to focus on. Visibility and collection is ultimately going to define the success of your SOC. If you only see 10% of your important assets, you probably need to have a plan in place to grow and improve that. And then that comes to defining the success. How are you going to measure success? How are you going to justify that investment to the board in the first place? And then continuously evolve, streamline as you mature.